Hello the internet and welcome back to my channel. Today on the bench we have a Socket 7 motherboard which um, I found in a box and it said faulty on it. Now for the life of me I cannot remember when I purchased this board, uh, where I purchased from, why I purchased it. I can't remember anything about this. When I saw this box and it said faulty on it I was like what is this? I, I, I honestly can't remember anything about it. Now, this is a Socket 7, it's nothing really special, it's the A-Corp 5 ALI61, I guess ALI is because we have an ALI chipset on it. It's, uh, I think it's a baby AT board, it's nothing really special, but it's got lots of stuff, including an AGP slot, and all sort of controllers, two types of RAM here. Uh, there is a page on the retro web, so we have access to jumper settings and biases and information and everything. And uh, I'm assuming you know the retro web. If you don't, just go and take a look at the link. It's down below in the description. Uh, let me also thank the uh, maintainers of the retro web. Imagine we uh, retro guys we go and fix this board without the retro web where do we find the jumper sections where do we find all the information about this board where do we find the bios if we do, if we need it so uh, kudos to whoever is maintaining those uh, those pages thank you very much to you all we got plenty of information so hopefully we can fix this board whatever the problem is going to be I'm going to use this Pentium 233 MMX, if I'm not mistaken, the MMX is using two voltages for the CPU, so at least we can check that both voltages are working fine. I'll find some uh, RAM and uh, we can give it a go. Also, on this video, I'm going to show you a new tool I have. It's a Fenusi DSO TC3. It's, uh, at least for me, mainly a component tester. Now, I think I kind of given up making reviews because it takes too much time to do a, a proper a good review it takes a huge amount of time so uh, this is not going to be a video review this is going to be a repair but uh, we're going to use this tool on this repair and the uh, reason i accepted to get these for free by the way so that's something you need to know uh, is that uh, my own component tester is very old and it was very cheap at the time i think it was like five six quid on on ebay at the time and, and the ZIF uh, socket here, it's a bit uh, worn out, I would need to replace it. So uh, I thought, why not? We can give it a go. Uh, but this is not going to be a review. I'm not going to spend like 20 minutes talking about it. We're just going to use it together and uh, we'll see how it works. I would say enough me talking. Let me plug a power supply on this thing so we can start doing some basic measurements. Okay, so I've set the jumpers for my Pentium 233. So I've got the core voltage set to 2.8 volts. I've got the clock, the bus clock at 66 megahertz and the multiplier to 3.5. So that's done through these uh, jumpers here and the jumpers here. Now, if I'm looking at this board, I don't see any obvious damage. It doesn't mean there is no damage, but I can't see much besides something here. It looks like maybe someone has redone some traces but i can't really see much so let me turn on the microscope and we'll take a look together yes it looks like someone has been here before i'm pretty confident it wasn't me even though honestly i can't remember anything about this board so let's have a look a bit closer it should work because someone removed the solder mask here on the right and on the left uh, i think it's gonna work this doesn't look properly soldered if you look if you know if you know what i'm saying I don't know what type of component that is. It's SMD, it doesn't have any marking, but I would say we probably want to try and reflow this a bit. We can check with a multimeter. Okay, so I have my multimeter in continuity mode. Yeah, this is working and the next one. Okay, so it's fine. So this is also fine. And what is this? Is that pad actually making connection? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so because I'm touching the, the top of the component and also the pad and I have no continuity. I think this is going to work. Yeah, so this is working. Oh, yes, it is working, uh, but not this one. So this needs to be reflow. Whatever that is, <laughs> it's not really making contact underneath. This could be the fault with the board. Let me continue with the troubleshooting. Let me make sure we have the voltages and everything. And let's make sure that this board actually doesn't work. Then we'll fix that pad. And if we see, we will see that whether that is the actual problem. All right, before I fit the processor or anything else, I have my diagnostic uh, card here. Let's make sure we have all the voltages and most importantly that the reset line is actually there. So let's power up in three, two, one, go. 
I didn't see the reset line flashing. So let me try this again, switch it off. And back on, three, two, one, go. No, so the reset line, it's always engaged. Um, but we have all the voltages but 3.3 volts, which is fine for this type of boards. I'm wondering whether the reset line of working is actually that I see there, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, let's uh, flip the board around and make sure the uh, processor is getting the proper voltages and clock, maybe, and then we'll fit the processor and we'll see whether this is actually doing anything or not. 3, 2, 1, go. 5.3 volts. No, that's not what I'm expecting. <laughs> I'm not expecting 5 volts here. Uh, what am I getting on the other side though? 3, 2, 1, go. 3.4 is fine, but here I'm expecting 2.8. 5.3 will fry the CPU. This could very possibly be that there is no load, and with no load, the regulation doesn't really work, and, and you get those silly voltages. I would say let's uh, find the load and confirm what voltages we're getting. All right, I have a 100 ohm resistor and uh, I should be plugged into where on the other side we were reading 5 volts. Let me check that without connecting the resistor, just checking on the lead here. 3, 2, 1, go. Yeah, 5.3 volts, perfect. Now let me ground the other end of the resistor. Now in theory that should uh, uh, trigger the regulation circuitry, so the voltage would go down to 2.8 volts. So let's try this again, 3, 2, 1, go. No, <laughs> the voltage is not dropping. There is something with the regulation circuitry here. So that might be the fault. And I'm wondering whether this is, would have killed my CPU if I hadn't checked the voltages first. Now the jumper was in the correct position. I've just changed it to a random voltage, 2.2 volts. So let's see if the, we see any difference whatsoever on the voltage delivered on the CPU socket. Three, two, one, go. No. 5 point, maybe a little lower, but it's still way too high. Now the regulation is done by this little IC here. This is um, basically a, what's that, like a switching controller, which is driving this, uh, this, I think this is a transistor and this is a diode, and it's an HIP608C3. So that is reading the jumpers that you're setting and is controlling the, uh, the regulation based on the jumpers, of course. So either, that has a problem, or maybe the transistor has gone, uh, or the diode, I mean, there must be something. Now, one thing I'm seeing is that this capacitor here, I don't know, it seems a little weird. It doesn't look like it has exploded, but it's like dirty on top. There's something on it. It, it doesn't look right. Let me show you. So we are in between the capacitor and let's call it a transistor, and I see something between them, and I have no idea what that is. Also, as I said, the top of the capacitor looks, maybe it's just dirty, but I, I don't understand why only this one looks dirty and the other ones are totally clean. Let me show you another one for comparison. I mean, this looks okay, but most importantly, there's something there. It looks like grease. Okay, uh, it is some greasy substance but I'm wondering how he ended up there. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I don't know, and I'm not sure I wanna know. Well, it's difficult to say, but I think it looks okay. You know, I thought maybe something exploded there, um, but the transistor seems clean in that spot. I don't know, we'll have a look. Anyways, um, that was just out of curiosity. So let's continue with, you know, testing components and, and see why we're getting this five volts instead of 2.8. Now, looking at the components, this one, it's a MOSFET, it's an N-channel MOSFET, and this one is a rectifier, it's a diode. Okay, so um, obviously this is a controller, the controller is controlling the MOSFET, the MOSFET then goes into the diode, into the inductors, into the capacitor, well, through the capacitor, and then through the uh, socket here. So, you know, it's a simple circuit, um, so I would say that either the controller is bad or the um, MOSFET is bad, maybe the capacitor is bad, or maybe both that bad. Uh, let's turn around the board and check some voltages first. Right, so here on the left-hand side we have the MOSFET, and on the right-hand side we have the diode. Just out of curiosity, let me see what voltages we're getting. Uh, so 3, 2, 1, go. We got 6.8 volts, don't know where they're coming from, 4.9, and 5.3, which is what we are reading at the at the motherboard. I'm wondering whether we might have a 
short in here, so I'm uh, using my multimeter into diode mode and I can check whether I'm reading something here. The power supply is switched off. Yes, it is. That looks like a short. That looks like a short. That looks like a short. It's the dead short uh, on the diode. It would probably reflect that. Yeah. And yeah, everything is shorted. <laughs> Right, so it looks like we might have a problem here. Let me just grab my thermal camera. I am suspect it's going to be the MOSFET shorted, but maybe the thermal camera will tell me a bit more. Let, let's give it a go. All right, thermal camera is out. So let me power up. I'm um, aiming at the regulation section in three, two, one, go. Right, yes, we do have something glow in there and it's the controller. Okay. So it's actually interesting that with this camera, it's my new TS-001 from Topton, that you have a link down below in the description, you can actually see all the traces and the inside of the IC lighting up. Is that the IC shorted, uh, like broken or something, or is it the MOSFET, which happens to be connected to heatsink? And you can see the MOSFET is also glowing. Let me focus it. There you go, but not as much. Let me power this off before it catches fire not as much because it's on a heatsink. Obviously, you don't see that as much as the as the controller there, but you can clearly see that also the MOSFET, it's also glowing a bit. So um, let's hope that it's just the MOSFET and it's not like the whole thing, like the MOSFET and the controller, or maybe just the controller, because uh, I think the MOSFET is kind of, you know, it's a, it's a MOSFET, so it's easy to find. The uh, controller, might be a bit more complicated, but we shall see. So um, I would say to continue here with the diagnosis, uh, we need to remove the MOSFET first, and that will tell us if, whether the MOSFET is gone, or the diode or the everything else. So let's remove it first. Right, the MOSFET is out, and this is where this little component tester comes into play. Now, I've been using my own component tester for many years, and every now and then I got people asking me, where, where can you buy this magic tool? Because I remember when I uh, saw this online being used by someone, it's like, oh wow, that's magic, it does everything in one little thing. This is very, very, or at least it was, very inexpensive. I think I paid it like five pounds. It was just a board, and then I purchased what was supposed to be a case. It didn't, never worked, so it's always been like this, and, and it's always worked. So we're gonna use it now. We're gonna test this MOSFET using this. Now, unfortunately, the MOSFET has big legs. It doesn't, they don't fit into the, well, the, they would have been longer and thinner, but they're being trimmed, obviously, to fit the motherboard. Uh, they would have fit the tester, but not in this situation. So I'm going to use these three pretty, you know, could have been better, to be honest, leads. Okay, I've got the MOSFET connected. So let's get into the M tester here. And it's reading as a resistor. So that should mean that this is shorted. Now, to be honest, you don't need a component tester for this because I'm guessing that if I'm using my multimeter in diode mode or even in continuity mode, it would probably tell me straight away that this is completely shorted. So let's double check this. Shorted, shorted, shorted. This is all shorted, of course. Anyways, I can definitely recommend a component tester, whatever you're gonna buy, uh, because it's a fantastic tool. I happen to have a replacement for this MOSFET here, so we can actually check it. Uh, you know, I stick it, the component into the component tester, press OK, wait a few seconds, and it tells me immediately it's a MOSFET, it's an N-channel MOSFET, that's the configuration, so pin number one is gate, pin number two is drain, pin number three is source, and it also comes with a number of parameters which might be useful when uh, checking components. I'm using the component tester mostly for capacitors, but when it comes to capacitors, multimeters are not great, and uh, component testers have something that can be useful, like the ESR. Let me show you an example. Right, for example, this is a 22 microfarad capacitor and the um, capacitance here is read as 18.5 microfarad, which is still okay, but the ESR is 17.6. That's way too high. This I know for, for a fact that this is a bad capacitor and uh, I'm assuming that if, you, if you're testing it using the Fluke here, 
it's pretty difficult to do that. But anyways, you can see it's actually reading 22 microfarad. So you might be tempted to think, oh, this is a good capacitor. It's not. Trust me, it's not. Um, but the um, component tester is telling you, hey, the ESR is 17.6, which for a 22 microfarad capacitor, it's way too high. So definitely get a component tester. They are pretty inexpensive. I can't remember the price of this one, to be honest. And they're very, very useful for those components which are not straightforward to test. Later on at the end of the video, after we finish this board, assuming we finish this board on this video, I don't know yet, <laughs> I'll show you something I've noticed, which is a little, I don't know, I really don't know what to come up with, with what I've discovered. Now, this little tester here also comes with other features. You have these three connectors here at the top. Uh, it can read voltages, but if you notice that I haven't even used it to read the voltages there, because um, it comes with these adapter here, which you plug here at the top. And, and then, yes, you can read voltages. There's a menu here somewhere. Under tools, you got voltage. There you go, you got this voltage reading there. But the thing is, it, it doesn't really come with probes. It comes with this. It's a nice thing to have, but I wouldn't use it um, as, an, an, as a multimeter. But most importantly, this thing comes with an oscilloscope. We're gonna check that later. I haven't really, I, I played with it a little bit, but we haven't really, I haven't really tested it with the voltage and stuff. So once we got the board up and running, I think we can give it a go and, and check this thing. Uh, this thing comes with, I would say a couple of major limitations. Number one is the bandwidth. Uh, which is only uh, 500 kilohertz. Now, 500 kilohertz nowadays is very little. You wanna uh, check the clock on this board, it's gonna be 66 megahertz. So that makes it not the greatest oscilloscope that you can get, if you know what I'm saying. The other thing, obviously, it's a small screen, it's, it, you know, everything is very limited. Now, it's a nice thing to have, but I don't think I can recommend this as an oscilloscope. And fair enough, we'll test it in a, in a few minutes. But when it comes to a component tester, happy days. And again, check the end of the video for a couple of notes about that. For an oscilloscope, I would recommend you buy an oscilloscope. Or uh, I know there are some portable oscilloscope which are actually pretty good, but tools are not like mobiles or computers. You know, they get obsolete after a few years or even a few months. Tools will last a long time. My Fluke multimeter here, it's great. It will last me a long time and it will work beautifully throughout all these years. My Siegelint oscilloscope, uh, it was like obviously a budget oscilloscope, not too expensive, but it's a proper oscilloscope. It says 100 megahertz on it. It is a 100 megahertz oscilloscope. So that will last for many years. Before that, I had a Fluke. It was a CRT oscilloscope. It was an analog oscilloscope with digital controls, but it was still analog with a CRT. And it lasted me like, I think 15 years. And I sold it after 15 years uh, at a higher price than I paid it when I purchased it 15 years before. So what I'm trying to say is the budget is yours. You do what you want. I'm just saying that if you buy a good tool, E will last for a long time. They don't have a, a best before date on it, an expiration date on it. So when it comes to the component tester, I'm happy that this is portable, it's nice, it's rechargeable, and it's got these extra features, like you can measure a voltage. If, if you only have this one with you, you can measure a voltage. Uh, there's a signal generator, which is another feature here, generator. Uh, this is, I feel, is pretty handy, even though I understand it's not super accurate. It's a nice thing to have. The oscilloscope, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we'll test that in a minute. We've now discovered that our MOSFET is gone. So let's go back on the board and see whether we have a short. No short here and no short here. That's great. So before I uh, replace the MOSFET, I'd like to try and turn it on without the MOSFET to see whether the controller is like overheating like it was doing before, but I guess we can give it a quick go. All right, thermal camera is on. Let's turn it on without the MOSFET and see what happens in three, two, one, go. Oh, still, is it uh, probably getting less hot than before? I think it's okay. I didn't. I forgot to check the temperature earlier on. No, it's fine. It's not scorching hot. It was scorching hot before. I forgot to check. And the software of this camera has a little, well, let's call it a bug. 
is still version 0.6 and you can't really read the temperature on uh, hotspots because it's a white character on uh, yellow or white uh, color. So no, it looks fine. I think that's the, the way it works. So let's um, install the MOSFET and see if this uh, board comes back to life. And then we still have to fix that pad at the, at the corner. I have a feeling the reset line is not going to work, but that's pure speculation. I'm going to replace the CEP703AL with these, uh, I can't really read it, P3020L, which is a compatible N-channel MOSFET, which means uh, mainly that it has the same voltage and same current of this one. So hopefully that's going to work exactly as the other one. Right, MOSFET is replaced. Is it gonna work? Well, let's try and see what happens. I think the controller is still set to 2.2 volts. So let's try in three, two, one, go. No, 4.9. That's not great, isn't it? 4.9 without a load. So let's try as before and let's add the load to this line and see if that changes anything. No, 4.9, mm, okay. Not working. <laughs> no, boo. <laughs> All right, this is the perfect occasion to test this little oscilloscope. Let's see if this little uh, TC3 it's up to the task and help us diagnosing this board. Now, before I begin, I just would like to mention again that I now have a second channel. It's called Tony259. No, it's not the best of creativity, but if you want to take a look, that would be great. I have uh, uh, videos which I feel don't belong on the first channel, on the main channel. So go and take a look if you want. I would really, really appreciate the subscription because right now I only have 800 uh, subscribers there. So if you enjoy those videos, thumb up and subscription. If not, well, you know what to do. This is a standard back converter uh, topology of circuitry. So this is basically acting like a, a switch and power supply, let's put it that way. So it's sending a switched signal uh, pulse to the MOSFET and the MOSFET will just slice the voltage that comes from supply. And then that gets, gets uh, smoothened and rectified by the diode, by the inductor, by the capacitor, and then goes to the CPU and it, it, it's, it gets used. So the first thing I want to do, I want to check the uh, pin 12, which is called U-gate. And it's basically the driving signal for the MOSFET. So I'm expecting some kind of switching signal here. Let's power on now. So I'm measuring, well, the scope here says 7.97 volts. And I don't see any switching whatsoever. And uh, even if, I don't know, let's try the automatic feature. Uh, well, somehow it's now changed to 12 volts. That's kind of weird. Anyways, we don't see switching. I don't understand why it wasn't on 12 volts a moment ago. I think I might have read something online. There's a bug with this firmware. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but that's not great. I don't see anything switching here. Now, as a reference, I also have my own oscilloscope, my Siglent oscilloscope. So if I'm checking here, uh, indeed, we are talking about 12.23 volts and there's no switching whatsoever. Now, let's go back to the Fenersi for a moment. Now, one thing I've noticed is that when I switch off, I do see something on the signal. So I'll switch it off, three, two, one, go. That's for a split moment, you see something in there. Uh, let's try again, I'll turn it on. There's nothing when you turn it on. When you turn it off, three, two, one, go. No, that could be kind of a limitation of this. Let me show you with the uh, Siglent oscilloscope. So let's turn it on. And now that's also in roll mode. So obviously in roll mode, you can see more things. And let's turn it off now. You see there's something that happens when you turn it off. Let me set a single uh, capture with the Siglent, something that you can't do with the Fenersi, if I'm not mistaken. There you go. So the Siglent has captured something when it was happening. And you see there is a glimpse of, um, I think there's a glimpse of switching here. I mean, the resolution is not great because it was captured at a wider resolution, let's call it that way. But it looks like the IC is trying to do something when it's being switched off. But that's mostly a curiosity and also something to show you that obviously uh, these things are getting a bit difficult to see on such a small oscilloscope. My main problem is that the switching IC is not switching. 
And I had a look at the um, data sheet of this IC and if there was an over, over current, over protection of somehow, this has, it's called the hiccup protection. So it would switch on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. Sometimes you can hear it on power supplies when there's a short, you can hear the power supply doing like click, 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 and it's just starting, 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 starting. But the fact that it's not doing that, it means from my point of view that it's not detecting anything wrong. It's not stopping because there's uh, an overcurrent, an over uh, protection somewhere. So to me, that that's telling me that it's broken. <laughs> that is not working. And there's probably no, not much that we can do about that. Now there is a power good signal coming from the uh, controller. I'm, I'm hoping it's not being used by the way, because I want to try something in a minute, uh, but I'm expecting because it's not even switching that it's not going to be high. Yeah, there's nothing happening here. Obviously, um, the, the IC is not saying that power is good because there's no power. The only other thing I can check is that there is VCC going into the IC. Let's try this now. Three, two, one, go. Uh, yeah, there is 12 volts going into it. According to the Fenersi, by the way. I don't know why it was uh, measuring something different earlier on. So, yeah, it looks like we might need another controller. So, I have placed an order, which is coming from uh, China. Unfortunately, it's a um, kind of weird IC. Meanwhile, because I don't want to shelf this for a week, um, I'd like to try something. I would like to remove the MOSFET again, which I just fitted, and apply 2.8 volt where the MOSFET would normally generate 2.8 volts. Once we measure 2.8 volts at the CPU, we can try and power up. And then I guess we might need to take a look at that reset line unless that will magically fix the problem. So let me remove again the MOSFET and uh, we'll see if this thing actually works. All right, so I got my bench power supply wired here. It should inject uh, 2.8 volts in here. Everything is still switched off, including the motherboard. So let me power on everything now. I got 11 milliamps being drawn by what exactly i don't know anyways i should have 2.8 volts here perfect and 3.4 on the other end so that should be enough to power up my pentium 233 i guess we can try with the cpu we haven't checked the clock that the clock is getting to the cpu but you know let's um kind of assume it's gonna work and if it doesn't work obviously we will get there as well Three, two, one, go. I don't think he's doing anything. This is getting warm and the reset line is still not disengaging. So the reset line is constantly on here on uh, the postcard. We might have a problem with that or as I said before, without the controller I see there issuing a power good line, nothing is working. So, you know, I don't want to overthink this. Um, I'll wait for the replacement, of course, but I would say maybe this is time to fix the little resistor or whatever component that was, the SMD resistor, which is by this IC here. I don't know, I have this guts feeling that this is something to do with the reset line. Don't ask me why. Let's put that under the microscope, fix that, test it again. Then, you know, we'll wait for the component and we'll move from there. All right, so this is a simple logic IC. It's a 74F04, it's a hex inverter. Um, so I don't know what the role of it is. And uh, let's see whether I can kind of ascertain what kind of component that white one is. Yeah, it reads 40, 40 ohms. So maybe it's a simple resistor. So let's just reflow it, make sure it's sitting there nicely, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Hopefully, maybe that will fix something. I mean, it, it can't make it worse, can it? Right, I'm not sure what's wrong with the solder. It doesn't seem to stick to the component. So let me remove the uh, the existing solder. Maybe someone tried to use some lead-free or something else. Uh, but first thing first, let's try and see whether this component has any uh, label at the back. Yes. <laughs> so someone has definitely been there. Now let's try and find out what it says. Right, so I guess this is going to be at 100 ohms. Let's try and measure it. 10 ohms, of course, it's a 10 ohm and the zero is the multiplier or something like that. So it's a 10 ohm resistor and it's working totally fine. So let's uh, clean those pads and uh, then I'll try to resolder it. Uh, 
I knew that. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, it's not my best job, but uh, I think it might work. I'm not entirely sure why that SMD resistor wasn't sticking to the solder. Uh, either maybe the pads at the, uh, on the other side were damaged, I don't know. But anyways, it should be connected now. We can actually check. Here it should read 100, uh, 10, sorry, and it's reading 11, it's fine. And then I'm going here and it's reading 11, perfect. So that's working, perfect. I wonder what happened there, it's just physical damage. Let's see if it makes any difference, I doubt it, but that needed to be fixed anyways, that resistor was definitely not making contact before. So let's power up in 3, 2, 1, go. No. And I still don't have... that reset line is still not working. So the only thing I can hope is that there is some kind of feedback with the controller there, and this is also driving the uh, reset line, I do not know, but uh, that's, uh, that's my hope. So I guess I'll wait for the spare part and hopefully that will sort out the problem. Well, a few days have passed and I finally got some replacement ICs from AliExpress. So let's swap the one on the motherboard and hopefully that will fix the problem. Alright, so I guess this is the moment of truth. I set the uh, voltage, the V-Core for random voltage, 2.2 volts. Uh, let's see what we are getting. 3, 2, 1, go. Whoa, 2.2, it's working! Amazing! Right, okay, so <laughs> we can try the CPU back, I guess. Let's uh, reset it to the voltage that needs, 2.8 volts, and double check that. That should be 2.8 now. 3, 2, 1, go. And we got 2.8, fantastic. So that was definitely both the MOSFET and the controller. It kind of makes sense that it can happen. So it's time to plug the CPU and see if this thing actually posts. All right, I got heatsink, video card, postcard, which you can't see, appreciate that, some RAM, and uh, I guess I'm ready to go. I kind of feel optimistic. So finger crossed, this is gonna work. Power up in three, two, one, go. No, it's still dead. The reset line doesn't work. The reset line doesn't go away. Ooh. Boo. <laughs> no. Well, no, it doesn't work. And I think there's no point in looking into um, other things unless the reset line disengages. The reset line is solid red on my post analyzer and either there's something with the board or the reset line circuit is not working for whatever reason. Now, I'll have to look on how the reset line works on this board. Uh, one thing I wanna also look at, this board has AT and ATX power supply. And I'm just wondering whether this is somehow waiting for a power on button. Now, I don't think the manual has information about that. I can't see much in here. There is a power switch pin here for, for a button, but if I short it while the board is in a reset state, nothing really happens. So um, I might need to have a look at that. I don't know what to do now at the moment. I was hoping that the power supply was the only problem. Watch this space, I'll come up with a better way to show you the postcard from the overhead camera. But uh, the first discovery is not good because I've tried to plug in the power supply straight into the ATX uh, connector and this is what happens. So the board is idle and if I short the power switch here on the header, 
the board is actually starting, the power supply is starting, but the reset line is not going away. So it looks like the uh, it's not like a, an ATX problem, I think, because the, the circuit to power on the ATX works. It's just then the reset line doesn't disengage for whatever reason. All right, so I've been uh, poking around this board for quite some time. You might be seeing some of the solder mask scraped off the board to try and, and trace where things were going. And it, it's taken me quite some time. And I thought, right, to find out where this reset, this reset line is coming from, maybe I can start from the reset switch. That might take me uh, roughly where the reset line is happening, when the logic is happening. And I trace that line, it goes through a resistor and it comes to this little IC here on the bottom right. It says 34 ohms, so it's going through a resistor, so that's fine. And as I said at some point, I had this guts feeling that this IC was actually responsible or maybe involved in the reset line uh, uh, logic. Now that little IC, it's a simple inverter. Whatever goes in, it comes out inverted, which means if you've got something going in high, it will come out low and vice versa. So if you've got five volts coming in, it will be zero volts coming out. If you've got zero volts coming in, it will be five volts or whatever the, uh, the VCC of that IC is as an output. So the reset button goes into pin five and it comes out of pin six inverted. And pin six goes back into the same IC into pin nine and which gets inverted again and comes out out of pin eight and it gets lost uh, around the motherboard. I couldn't really find it where it was going. So, you know, that was kind of a dead end. I thought, right, what do I do from here? Now, I decided to go and take a different approach. I thought, right, let's find where the reset line of the ISA slot is going. And guess what? Even the reset line is going to this little IC here. That's gonna be pin three and it comes out out of pin four inverted again. And I found that pin four is reaching this via here. And this via here is reaching another via here. And this via here is directly connected to this pin here of the IDE connectors, which happens to be the reset line for the IDE devices. I'm assuming that the uh, an IDE hard drive needs uh, an inverted reset compared to the ISA. I guess it's the same with the PCI slots, apparently. But anyways, uh, from there, I couldn't find anywhere else on the board where I could trace that signal. And it took me a while to maybe realize that maybe that was the end of the line for that signal. That's it, it comes from the ISA, it's been inverted, it reaches the IDE reset line, and that's it, it just ends there. So I felt like I was back to square one, to be honest. I couldn't figure out where the reset line was coming from. And at some point I thought, right, wait a minute, there's not much on this board. We got the CPU, got the uh, BIOS, that's the VRM for the vCore, that's the cache. Uh, that's something to do with the cache. It's another cache model. Then we have the chipset. This is the uh, clock generator IC. Uh, these two ICs are for the serial and parallel ports. Then we have this IC here, ALI, which is for calendar and date. And then we have this inverter here. There's nothing else on these boards besides, you know, resistors and that kind of stuff. So again, uh, where is this coming from? I, I, you know, it must be before my eyes. It must be something simple. And after a while of poking and documentation and everything, I found that the reset line on these type of motherboards is coming from the South Bridge, from the ALI M1543. And uh, thankfully there is a very nice documentation that documents absolutely everything about this chipset. And yes, the ALI, the 1543, is receiving a power good line from somewhere. And when the power good line is high, it means the power is good. Then the reset line is being removed and the system can start. Now, fortunately, the South Bridge is BGA, so it's not as easy as just probing uh, little legs, and it's taken me a while. That's why I scraped off uh, the solder mask around it. However, the uh, documentation mentions power good, and the AT power supply and also the ATX power supply, they do have a power good line, which happens to be this pin here at the very end. It's the gray one on my connector. And it basically becomes five volts when all the other voltages are good and up and running. So that tells the board power is good, you can go on. So I started tracing the power good line from the power supply and guess where it goes? It's going to the same IC and actually goes to pin five, which is the same pin where the reset button is going. And that was a bit like, how is that even possible? 
Anyways, as I said before, the uh, reset button is coming out of the inverter, inverted, and it goes, it goes back into the inverter, it's being inverted again, and I said that then it gets lost through the motherboard. But now I know that the south bridge is uh, potentially expecting that signal. So I started again scraping off the solder mask from the board and the power good pad on the uh, of the south bridge happens to be thankfully at the very edge of uh, the ic i marked it i marked it here with this uh, green dot so i started probing things and i found that the output of the inverter which is my power good line apparently and the reset button at the same time it comes here to a trace which I can see is going, seems to be going straight to the power good uh, pad under the BGA. So that makes sense. And I think it also explains the behavior of the reset button. The reset button is basically bringing down the power good line. So the south bridge is when you push the reset button, the, the south bridge at some point uh, is reading like the power supply has failed. So everything stops until power good is going back up. So I thought maybe we have a bad power good signal and I'm probing the power good line out of the inverter. There is a zero ohm resistor and then I'm assuming it's going straight into the south bridge. And when I power up, three, two, one, go, I'm reading 3.5, which is like, okay, it's kind of, kind of weird, this 3.5, I would expect like five volts and not 3.5. However, uh, computer guys from the um, retro web discord server, thank you very much, happens to have exactly the same motherboard and he was kind enough to take it out and take some measurements for me. And he told me that the re uh, power good line out of the inverter is actually 3.5 volts. And I think then I realized why, because the IC itself, the inverter itself, it's actually powered with 3.5 volts. That's the power uh, going into the inverter, 3.7, and then I guess we have some loss inside. So that's the best that the inverter can do. It's powered with 3.5, so the high signals out of the inverter can only be 3.5. So that's totally normal, unfortunately. Now, the south bridge, apparently, I, I can't check directly, I can't go, I can't poke under the BGA, unfortunately, is getting power good line. So according to the document documentations, uh, when power good is good, the reset line should be uh, disabled and that is not happening. Um, another thing I've discovered is if I'm probing the reset line with my multimeter and I turn on power, three, two, one, go, I'm getting these 2.37 volts. And I checked the other day, it was actually 1.7. Yesterday was 2.2, today is 2.7. It's a bit all over the place. Uh, with the oscilloscope, it actually looks pretty stable, pretty, pretty flat. I don't know why it's going up and down in voltage. And the computer guys told me that reset line on its board is 3.5. So I would expect the reset line to be 3.5 or zero, not 2.2 or 1.7. So unfortunately, this points to an issue with the south bridge, unless there's some other conditions which I don't know about. Uh, you know, I skimmed through that uh, documentation, it's several hundred pages which is still preventing the south bridge from releasing the reset line. But that being said, I would still expect the reset line to be zero or 3.5, not something in between. Something in between uh, smells of something else going on here. Now the south bridge is BGA. I'm not very good at doing BGA. And also we got capacitors and plastic all around. So, you know, it's not something I'm looking forward to, to replace, though that is still available on, Ali on AliExpress. And I also understand this is the B1 revision of the south bridge, which is the best available apparently. Thank you very much, Alex of Bits and Bolts to point that out. I didn't know about that. Now, before I go with the idea that swapping the south bridge is the only option for this board, there's one one final option I'd like to try on this board, which actually is to swap these inverter. And the reason is the reset line ends up going on through the inverter anyways, because it's being inverted to go to the ID. And maybe the inverter is faulty or maybe something's happening somewhere else, which is fighting the reset line. And that's why I'm reading that uh, 2.7, 2.2 or 1.7, depending on the mood of, of these IC. And hopefully uh, that could be our problem. 
And what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove the AC and test the reset line without it. So at that point, the reset line should be completely isolated. I, I'm assuming because I, I don't have schematics. And at that point, if the reset line doesn't read either 0 or 3.5, then I know that that weird voltage unfortunately is coming from the south bridge, uh, kind of confirming that we need a new south bridge, unfortunately. So let's go ahead, let's remove the south bridge and we'll... No, not the south bridge. So let's go ahead and remove the inverter and we'll test again the reset line once the IC has been removed. Now let's check what we are getting on the reset line now that the inverter is not on the board. Three, two, one, go. No, we are getting the same two point something that I was reading earlier on, which is weird. The other day was 1.7, now it's 2.2. So no, I don't think that the new inverter is gonna fix anything because if the reset line without it is 2.2, I really don't think that you know a new inverter will fix it. But I got it, <laughs> let's install it, uh, you know, just to be on the safe side. And then I guess uh, we need a new south bridge, unfortunately. Okay, the inverter is replaced. I have no expectations at all. I'm on the reset line here. I'm not sure why it's reading 0.3 volts. I haven't turned it on yet, but it's reading 0.3. Where is it coming from? I have no idea. The battery? But anyways, anyways, um, well, that might be a clue for, for something else. Turn it on, three, two, one, go. No, it's reading 2.3 as before. Again, it was 1.7 the other day. And I guess if I put my postcard in here, which you can't see, I know, but if I turn on, the reset line doesn't go away, unfortunately, it remains uh, enabled all the time. So it looks like this might be the end of the road for this board, unless I go ahead and replace the BGA Southbridge. Now, uh, I'm a bit puzzled that we have an issue with the Southbridge, but also we had an issue with the VRM, they're completely independent, I don't understand what happened to this board. But anyways, at this moment, uh, despite my gut feelings telling me there might be something else, uh, all my investigation is pointing at the South Bridge. So that would be the next logical step. Now, because I'm not a fan of BGA, I really don't want to do it, but I think I have an idea on how to uh, move forward. And the idea is, if you really want to see me purchasing a replacement uh, BGA South Bridge, then leave a comment down below. Let me know, like, subscribe, if this video at some point in the future reaches 10,000 views, which are not many, but for me are quite a lot, then I will go ahead, order a replacement and go through the VGA route. If not, well, we'll see what happens. I might do it at some point in the future, but at this time, I think I would like to uh, focus my attention on maybe a different project and then, and then we shall see. So I guess this is it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, as usual, I'd appreciate a thumb up down below and also consider subscribing to this channel if you like this kind of things. Don't forget I'm on Twitter and also on Patreon. My Patreon names are scrolling at the side of the screen. Thank you very much for your support. You're absolutely amazing. There is a free tier on Patreon, so you have no excuses. If you don't want to join Patreon, then maybe you can buy me a coffee. The link is also down below in the description. If you don't want to do anything, well, that's totally fine. Just watching this video, maybe liking it, subscribing it, uh, leaving a comment. That would be really, really important for me. And I appreciate your time anyways, and I hope you enjoyed. I hope you have a great day. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time for my videos on my channels. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye. As I said earlier on, I just wanted to show you something uh, that I don't know exactly how to explain about the component tester. Because as I said, I got this because of the component tester feature, uh, the oscilloscope. Um, I have my own. I, I, think, I think I'm never going to use this one but mainly because of the component tester. Now, uh, I have some capacitors here and uh, let me test them in both component tests. And again, bear in mind that this is no reference at all. This is from eBay ages ago. It was really inexpensive. So I haven't got a reference system, unfortunately. That's what I'm trying to say. Now here I got the same capacitor which we tested earlier on. It's a 22 microfarad and it's saying 18.8 it's saying microfarad. ESR pretty high, 16.3. So fair enough, it means it's not in the greatest shape. Now, if I'm using my other component tester, which, as I said, is no reference at all, unfortunately, I really haven't got like a reference tester for this. 
Besides that I'm getting a different capacitance, I'm getting a massively higher ESR. 0.11 kilo ohms, is that 110 kilo ohms? So it's like 10 times higher than that one. And the V-loss from 0.6 goes to 5.2. So according to this component tester, this capacitor is junk. And I know it's junk, by the way. According to this component tester, it is still junk. It's 16.3 uh, ohms uh, for the 22 microfarad is not good, but it's not 0.1 kilo ohms, if you know what I'm saying. This is another example, 10.1 microfarad, V-loss is 0.1, ESR 1.5, more or less great for a 10 microfarad, 1.5 is really great. My other component tester is reading 10.1, fair enough. V-loss 2.2, which is so much higher than that one, and ESR of 16, which is like, no, it's way too high. So, uh, I don't know, which one do I trust? This is a 10 microfarad capacitor, and according to this tester, it's actually not bad. V-loss is 0.1, ESR is 0.42, so, you know, from my point of view, that would be totally fine. Now, according to my older component tester, the capacitance is the same, V-loss is now 1.4, it's, again, it's 10 times higher, and the ESR is 6.8, which, again, is, it's... It's massively higher, you know, 0.42 means to me, great, this is perfect. 6.8, I mean, for, for a 10 microfarad, it's still not too bad, but it's definitely not 0.42, if you see what I'm saying. Now, I know that these component testers are not super accurate when it comes to that, but I wasn't expecting, like, tenfold difference <laughs> when it comes to ESR, which is, I would say, it's the main reason I have a component tester, because everything else I can use other tests, they're probably testing like transistors and stuff so I don't have to fiddle with my uh, multimeter. I don't know what to make out of it and I appreciate I should have like a proper LCR tester to come up with um, a, a final statement about the accuracy of both these component testers. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the Fenersi is bad and this is good because yes, I've been using this for many years. I kind of feel it's working well, but I haven't got a reference. Now, unfortunately, I have found online some evidence that the ESR reading of the uh, TC3 is not great. And uh, then I ex I'm experiencing this, and I don't know what to say. Again, unfortunately, I can't I haven't got that tester, that good tester, so I can't say this is good, this is bad, or vice versa. But this is unfortunately leaving me with, wait a minute, I mean, all these components which I've been replacing because this tester is telling me they're really bad. Now, this is telling me they're really good. <laughs> and I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting one telling me 10 ohm, one telling me 12 ohms. <laughs> you know, that kind of 20% that kind of uh, uncertainty, not... 100%, no, 100 times, there's not 100%. So, uh, I, I don't know, now I'm, I'm, I don't know, I feel like I need an LCR meter, because <laughs> now I can't trust any of this. I haven't found a reviewer that used an LCR meter to compare the TC3 with um, a reasonably good quality LCR meter. So I'm just leaving this to you here. I, I'm, unfortunately, when it comes to myself, I was hoping to use this as my new component tester, and now I'm a bit careful because I don't want to suddenly have all my components to read they are great when they are not. So, I don't know. Uh, let me know what you think about it. If you are familiar with this uh, tester, if you happen to have a reasonably good LCR tester, were you able to compare the TC3 to a reasonably good uh, LCR tester? And what's uh, your finding? What did you find? That would be great. If you can leave a comment down below, I can pin it. So whoever is watching this video, maybe they can find something in the uh, comment sections to complete what I'm unable to complete for lack of uh, better tools.